commence primary ignition. Welcome back, friends, fans, and collectors. It is Wednesday, so we're talking Andor. Let's jump right in to episode seven, The Announcement. This episode opens with Cyril and Mom back at the little breakfast nook, and they start by talking about the interview that Cyril has upcoming. Mom does a little more digging into his image, and we hear that Cyril's uncle got him an interview. Next, we travel to Coruscant, where we were teased last episode the ISB response to this robbery. And it is a very intense, very imperial response of full-on authoritarian fascism. We get a monologue from a very high-ranking ISB officer who, based on the handlebar mustache and white hair, I can only assume is Admiral Yularen himself. Admiral Yularen oversaw the naval and clone forces throughout the Clone Wars. He rose through the ranks to be the head of the Imperial ISB, and we know him as one of the few people who has an actual face-to-face -face with Emperor Palpatine. This was mentioned in his monologue, as well as how ready and eager they are to respond, and the only question is how tightly they close their Imperial fists. We have noticed, all leading through this, a transitional period of the Empire, a very much Imperial Army and Navy. At peacetime, the Senate is still up and running. This rebel incursion really does mark the first change from peace times into the Galactic Civil War. Previously, we had seen that these individual branches had their own certain independent investigation bureaus, but this is now gone, and the ISB has full control over everything Imperial as well as everything Colonial. This is gearing up and getting to speed at to what we know the ISB is during the period of Galactic Civil War. All of these changes in Imperial leadership and doctrine are being ordered under a Public Order Resentencing Directive, or P-O-R-D for short. This directive states that anybody guilty of partisan activity will receive an incredibly increased tax. Since the Aldani Festival of the Eye was used as a cover, the Imperial ISB is also doubling down on any kind of culture activity and specifically targeting colonial festivals as covers for rebel activities. This is again authoritarian fascism 101. You demonize the cultural organization so that you can bring in stormtroopers and people like that to bash heads. Scary, scary stuff. Very Imperial stuff. We then return to Luthen at Coruscant. He's listening on the news dial for different broadcasts of the Eldani Raid. I was very surprised that Luthen did not include Mon Mothma in on his plans for this raid. He clearly did this action to seek financial freedom without her and without the need of her funds that are being overlooked by the ISB and the other Imperials. He hides this from her and probably hides a lot more from her because of her apparent reluctance for open rebellion. Now, Mon Mothma is very deeply entrenched in Imperial everything. We see this later with a really interesting dinner party, but that being that seeped in the culture, it really, really shows in her ability to take the plunge into starting a full open rebellion with the Alliance. Luthen hammers in this point of her knowing what it was from the start, when they started it, and, and at this stage in the rebellion, it either lives or it dies. He finishes by saying, if your conscience can't handle it, then turn yourself in and surrender, but this rebellion is moving. We pick up our story with Cyril at the Bureau of Standards, otherwise known as the Nerd Nexus of Star Wars. These guys seem to be the statistical bros who just sit there and calculate and enter data. It is somehow even less glamorous visually than the guy who actually is giving him the interview says in words. And Cyril is clearly a little bit dismayed by how blah this is. We do get the surprise of a mouse droid in this little bureau. Really cool to see it buzzing along on the floor there. And it did add some Star Wars flair into this really, really cold and dark environment. We then get back to Coruscant. We're following a mysterious woman at first who uses tradecraft and spycraft to find a mysterious location. This woman is revealed to be Luthen's assistant, and she's also revealed to be meeting Vel, and into a more cosmopolitan Coruscant look. They talk about the raid that just happened. Vel informs her that the money is safe, and the assistant tells Vel that she already knows that and it's been moved. 
She's more concerned about the Ronto vehicle they escaped in and if it's going to leave a trail back. Now we can see that with all the rebels at this point, finding trails that can lead back to the leaders and lead back to the people who organized the raids are what's most important. The people who pull the trigger and actually make the moves down on the ground seem to be somewhat expendable in a lot of the eyes of these rebels. Closing up loose ends is definitely a priority, and this woman coaches Vel not only in this, but in the fact that this is the way of the rebellion and that Andor is her next target as a loose end that she left open. Vel is upset that Luthen is not there to meet her himself, and we learn that Luthen's assistant is the person who recruited Nemec, Tamarin, and Gorn, all the people who died. We also learn that they did have some apprehensions about Skeen himself and his loyalty, and now that they don't have to worry about that because Andor cooked him. Vel is certainly apprehensive, but takes the target of Andor and moves on. Vel is also curious about Cinta and is reassuring that she's also working her role for the Rebellion. We then return to Aldani, where we see Cinta covering up the last of their evidence and trying and planning to make her escape. As she does so, an Imperial Star Destroyer cuts overhead with two TIE Fighter escorts, and man oh man, this is an impending, really cool arrival of some scary guys. As we all thought he would, Cassian returns home to Ferrix to check on his mother. He sneaks in and finds that the whole place is under Imperial command and rule, and that he's a wanted man. He tells Martha that he wants to escape with her, and promises to return later to talk about it after checking in on Bix. Whatever image he had in his mind of returning to Ferrix was shattered because not only did Bix tell him that people in the town blame him for the Imperial takeover, but he's also a wanted man and can't survive here. But also that his mother is not going with him. And they have a really, really intense back and forth, some amazingly written dialogue where they, they part ways. We learn a lot about the characters and we learn that Mar Marva's rebellion is inside of her heart and she's going to be here fighting and that rebellion is grown when she sees other people fighting outside also. This is, Cassian really doesn't understand this and he says that he'll always be thinking about her, always be wanting to know why she didn't come with him and she responds that that's, that's love. And I think that, man, that's just, that's just a really powerful back and forth moment, but entirely not how Cassian thought this was going to go. This moment's especially important because it really is Cassian's coming of age moment. Even though he's a, he's a grown ass man, he really reaches an impasse where he has to take his own trail into his own hands. Marva even says it like he can't stay here and she can't go. Marva also insists that Cassian stop looking for his sister, which I think is interesting. I know it's probably because she doesn't want him to have any more pain and assumes that his sister is dead, but I gotta believe we're gonna see her again. There's just too much foreshadowing at this point. She's turning into a Chekhov's gun for this character. During Marva and Cassian's talk, we also get a really, really intense flashback of Clem, the moment he was, I think, killed and strung up by clone troopers, which again was extra painful. So this happened early on in the Imperial takeover of the galaxy. This is remembered by Cassian and must have happened at an early time of Imperial takeover of the galaxy because we see clone troopers marching through the street and clone troopers probably enacting this brutal deed. And this is a completely different light of clone troopers than we've seen with Star Wars, but a very re real reality of what the real Imperial takeover of the galaxy was like across numerous worlds. This also changes what we had thought might have happened. We thought that Clem might have been a rebel fighter, an early actual person to try and rise up against this. But in the scenario that we see, Clem actually was trying to stop people from raising up their voices and stop people from fighting in order to protect them. Now that, that just hammers home extra hard why it's so difficult that he was hung. And Marva does talk about this when she talks about reclaiming her kind of pride in the rebellion and need to fight. It's a great, great scene and really, really powerful character development. We get my favorite cameo yet at the senatorial dinner party of the Bothmas. 
and it is Chancellor Valorum, the old Chancellor Valorum, now a senatorial friend, and as we learn, lifelong childhood friend of Mon Mothma. Now, I didn't know that he was Chandrillan, but they share some talks about Chandrillan customs and old times, and Mon Mothma uses this as a cover to hint at the fact that she needs help and might be doing something that's not genuinely smiled upon by Imperial Eyes. Now, they also talk about how inexplicably linked she is to high Imperial life and how taxing that can be on somebody with morals. Mothma also asks him to propose a bill that would allow her to access her funds under the guise of a Chandrillan Foundation. This is a brilliant way for her to use a Trojan horse to access the amount of money she needs to help the rebellion. Next, we return back to the ISB with some more intrigue. I find it fascinating how Major Partagas puts these Imperial officers against each other and really uses this as a way for them to build and sharpen their claws not only against rebel targets, but really against each other. This competitive environment is really, really spooky and it does increase the amount of whispering and increase the amount of double talk and double hearing in the office itself. Now with this new public order, the ISB has full oversight over all Imperial branches and all Imperial documents. And Dear Jamira has used this opportunity to access and take a look at everything that could have possibly gone missing in the last number of years. Now she's doing this to try and document a rebel data or a potential database of stolen rebel devices and to try and track a pattern that may exist. Now this is taking from not exactly her sector which is these Imperials are very protective over and Blevin decides to call her out in the office entirely in front of everybody as overstepping her bounds. The competitive nature of the ISB breeds a really interesting dialogue between these officers. And we can see this in the forefront in this conference room where they have a debate over the issue. And Partagas side, sides with Mira, gives her access to Ferrix in the end, and congratulates her on doing a job well done. He also tells her to watch her back, but we can see that he clearly is picking a favorite, and we can see that he appreciates the way that she is gathering and holding on to information. Now we end this episode on the Star Wars equivalent of Mykonos. This seems to be a party island where you go and you blow a lot of money and hang out on the beach and take whatever Pizos are and drink whatever Resnog is. But a really, really kind of sleazy environment where we find Cassian living with somebody else under the guise of a new name of Keith. Cassian or Keith is, is sent off to, into town to pick up some more Pizos and Resnog and whatever alien doodads and drugs he's been having fun with there. We get a great cameo of a shore trooper running down the beach after some punkish people. Now this is funny to see because we know that at the nice beachy environments, the shore troopers, that that's their post and that's their armor. But this takes a different turn when a different shore trooper starts pretty much harassing Cassian and not letting him go anywhere. He assumes that this that he's part of some kind of mess or whatever, and it's clear that the mess doesn't even matter. The point is that the Imperials just looking to knock some heads. Cassian isn't allowed to leave, and we get the great appearance of a KX droid, one of his friends in the future, but certainly not his friend now, because this droid misinterprets the troopers hang out here and decides to hang Cassian above the ground with his metal hand. We also get some shots of Viper droids flying in the air. It's clear that this is a heavily Imperial trafficked area. Cassian gets thrown in jail on some trumped up charges due to the new Imperial orders that are bumped from six months in jail to six years in jail. We saw in the trailers him in an Imperial prison uniform. So this must be what we're gonna be seeing next episode. I thought this was a great episode. We got a lot of classic Star Warsy stuff, stormtroopers on screen, mouse droids, all kinds of aliens, and it still really did feel like the spy drama that we had been watching for the last six hours, but just in a more Star Warsy place and environment. This really does feel like a point of no return for the character of Cassian Andor. 
A lot of the things that were hanging over him in the past are leveled, like his debts, both financially as well as personally with Bix and his mother, and we see some space for him to craft a new life moving forward. Let me know what you think about all those stormtroopers, the mouse droids, the shore troopers, the KX droid. It was a great episode. I'd love to hear your comments below. Thanks for watching Binary Sunset Review. As always, I've been Mike. Your likes and your views are greatly appreciated. Have a great day out there. Stay safe, stay sane, and remember, the Force will be with you. Always. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe.